Right, welcome back. So if I've done this right, we'll have uh, we'll have looked at some of your sketches. We'll discuss what you can see in there. And what I'm going to show you on this slide is <laughs> the answer, based on a lot more time and a lot more work than we've we've had in the last um, the last session to where you've made your sketches. So here we can see um, three benches of sandstone, those are the three I picked out earlier. Here they're given different colours and you can see they're also assigned uh, names or letters to basically help uh, subdivide the stratigraphy. You can also see a number of measured sections, so labelled 1, 26 and 19, um, superimposed on the cliff face. And those same logs are, are shown in here, 1, 26 and 19. And you can see that uh, the lowest of the three sandstones, that's Rhoda W, which is coloured in, in green, that's shown as thinning and pinching out from left to right, which again is consistent with what we can see in the hillside here and hopefully what you have in your sketches. The overlying sandstone, that's what I labelled as number two earlier, that's shown in red here as Rhoda X and you can see that is also thinning and pinching out from left to right in the, in the correlation panel and that's borne out by what we can see here in the hillside as well. And the upper sandstone unit, that's, that's Rhoda Y, that's more continuous in the correlation panel, it's shown as thickening slightly from left to right as we go from measured section 1 to measured section 19, and again that's borne out by what we can see um, in the hillside in here. Uh, hopefully we've discussed these different points already. How can we explain those lateral variations in, in sand body thickness and bedding? And how can we how can we um, how can we identify the effects of those heterogeneity? So I'm not going to answer these questions. Hope we've done that already. Okay, so I'm now going to return a little bit to the the younger Oligocene cis conglomerate, which we said was in the, a unit called the cis Paleo Valley, or in a, in a feature called the cis Paleo Valley, and that's one of three similar Paleo Valleys which trend north south, and they they sort of overlie and cut across uh, thrust systems along the northern margin of of the the various. Uh, basins and then the south central Pyrenees. So the, these, those paleo valleys including the cis paleo valleys they're considered to be the main sort of routing systems, they're the main um, areas through which sediment, the coarse clastic sediment was fed into the, the Tremp Grouse Basin. Um, and that they're intended to be long-lived features so Potentially, um, I mean, the oldest the oldest rocks that we see within that 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 Paleo Valley today are Oligocene, um, but there's a large unconformity at the base of that. So lots of missing time there, and it's reasonable to infer that there may well have been rocks which are older that once uh, occupying that Paleo Valley, or that valley acted as a as a conduit to feed sediment at, at older times into the basin potentially even uh, during Rhoda sandstone deposition. Um, the composition of, of the class that we see within the Oligocene conglomerates um, indicates that basically they were, uh, that they were, erosion was taking place in the, the axial zone, so we're seeing carboniferous rocks for example, um, metamorphic rocks which are basically being exhumed and the erosional products have then been transported through the Paleo Valley. Um, okay, there's an overlying unit, the, Col the Collagats conglomerate, um, which which overlies the uh, the cis conglomerate, and that that has a a class composition which indicates um, that it was sourced from the external zone of the Pyrenees. So we're not seeing metamorphic rocks, for example. We're seeing basically reworking of of some of the Cretaceous and, and early tertiary rocks, uh, giving us provenance for those um, for those conglomerates. 
So here we are, Cispalia Valley in the background again. You've seen this picture already, the Cispalia Valley. Uh, here you're seeing a sort of nicer feature of that from a, a slightly different vantage point, picked out by snow. You can see the bedding really nice and clearly within the Cis conglomerate. And this this block diagram here sort of is a it's quite a nice graphical reconstruction of what that Paleo Valley might have looked like. So you can see that um, it, it it's it's quite a deep feature. You know, we're, we're talking about a valley which is probably in the order of um, half a kilometer to one kilometer in depth. You can see that the horizontal scale and the vertical scale are the same in this block diagram and you can see the scale at the bottom there. Um, that that valley was 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 effectively confined within very mountainous terrain. Um, and if we look at the bottom part of the block diagram you can see there's an underlying structural control. So there are there are basically thrusts or this this is really a a break in between the two thrust sheets so that you which are acting to um, create the surface topography which keeps the valley confined to this position for a, for a long time period. Um, just to go back a little bit to um, what I was saying earlier about uh, provenance and whether we, whether the um, the deposits moving through the Paleo Valley were being fed from the external zones of the Pyrenees or the internal zones of the Pyrenees. These are two block diagrams. The top one would be for relatively small catchments. So here, these catchments are eroding into limestones in, in the thrust sheets in here at the bottom. So those would be within the external Pyrenees. Um, that's being rooted through potentially the Cispelia Valley or, or Pelia Valleys like that. That's feeding sediment into in this case showing alluvial fans and those alluvial fans are confined uh, at the right hand end of the diagram by another um, structural feature, structurally controlled feature over here. So that would be the equivalent to um, the Collegats conglomerate, that, that's what's that, the younger than the Oligocene conglomerates we see in the Cispania Valley in the present day. And then if we look at the bottom picture in here, this this would be uh, more comparable to what we see within the cis conglomerate itself. So we, we have erosion of limestones and associated strata within the thrush sheets in here of the external Alps, uh, sorry, the external Pyrenees even. Um, and off behind those we see you know much more deformed rocks, um, which would be much more deeply buried and then exhumed within the internal Pyrenees, internal zones of the Pyrenees, and we're seeing effectively a much larger catchment. Sediment still being fed through um, the Cispalia Valley and, and similar Paleo Valleys, and then because I have a much larger volume of sediment, that's basically being it's moving further out into the basin, so it's overwhelming the structural relief further out towards the right hand side of the diagram. And effectively, we we're overfilling the basin, and we're exporting that sediment much further south. And that sediment would end up essentially within what is now the Ebro Plain. So that's the next basin further south of, of the thrust confined uh, basins that we've been looking at mainly. So that's just to give you an idea about um, how we might reconstruct the sedimentation history and link what we see in the catchment, what we see in the in these transfer systems of the valleys, the paleo valleys, through into the base and fill stratigraphy. And I'm going to stop there. We're going to move on to stop four sorry, five point two.